I, um, I still remember you gave a, a remarkable speech in Beijing in 1995, phenomenal speech, very powerful speech in Beijing, where you said uh, women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. And it was shocking at the time in the diplomatic world. And you've been working on women's rights issues for a long time, obviously before that. Can you say a little bit about you know, what it felt like in that moment? You know, flat, fast forward, you created a, an ambassador at large for women's rights at the State Department, uh, been very engaged around the world in, in advocacy. You have a new book, <laughs> if I can lift it. Uh, the book of Gutsy Women, uh, which is terrific, uh, stories of, of courage and resilience, uh, including uh, a wonderful uh, account of the late, great Betty Ford um, that I would recommend to you. So you've been, you've been working on these issues for a very long time. How has it felt to struggle on it? Um, what kind of progress do you feel like has been made? And, and obviously, there's a long way to go. Could you say a little bit about uh, the path forward? Sure. And... Um you know, next year, 2020, is the 25th anniversary of the uh, Beijing Women's Conference and that um, speech that I gave. It's also the 100th anniversary of American women uh, winning the vote. So it's a particularly important year. Um, you know, when uh, the Beijing Conference uh, was announced, uh, there was an American delegation. Uh, it was uh, headed at that time by the then UN ambassador, later Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright. It had Democrats and Republicans. It had men and women. It had a real cross-section of Americans. And uh, I was invited to go, uh, and there was a, a very uh, a worried reaction in uh, the Clinton administration uh, including in the State Department and in the uh, Congress, because uh, they weren't sure that we wanted uh, to draw as much attention as my going uh, would to the Beijing conference. Uh, some members of Congress were upset because China had imprisoned human rights activists and they didn't want me going unless they were freed. Um, and so it was not at all a given. And uh, I, I was very anxious to go and to be part of that historic moment, and eventually we, uh, we worked it out, and so I did go, and in the speech, um, I did take on China. I took on some of their practices, like forced sterilization, the one-child policy. I took on other, um, other problems uh, that affected uh, women and, uh, and families. Um, but it was a turning point in uh, a certain way because my speech, and particularly that phrase about women's rights being human rights, became a, a, a rallying cry. But in addition to the speech, there was something called the Platform for Action that was adopted. And it was adopted uh, unanimously by the you know, 180 or so countries that attended. And it, it did things that sound very simplistic now, but back then was considered radical. It said that domestic violence was a crime uh, not a cultural behavior, uh, and that countries should legislate and prosecute domestic violence, which was very controversial back then. So it had a lot of uh, meat in it. And I do think we have certainly made progress. Laws have been changed. Practices have been changed. Uh, a lot of places back in uh, 95, women could not inherit property from their families, from their husband, oftentimes, if their husband died in, in parts of Africa or Asia, uh, the brother of the husband would come and kick the, the widow and the children off the land and take that land over. So women had very few rights, rights to an education, rights to uh, health care, rights to economic opportunity, rights to full participation. So I, uh, back at the 20th anniversary of uh, Beijing, back in uh, 2015, um, I worked with uh, the Clinton Foundation and the Gates Foundation to do uh, a survey about the progress that had been made um, over uh, the last 20 years, and a number of people will do the same going into the 25th anniversary. So I think the 
sort of the short story is progress has been made, but not enough. It still is true that more girls are out of school than boys. Uh, fewer girls than boys go on to secondary school. Uh, and we're talking about the world uh, as a whole, uh, that more uh, health care is uh, denied uh, girls uh, than boys, that economic opportunity is still very difficult. And so when I was Secretary of State, <clears throat> I, I wanted to do a lot of research into this because I wanted to see two things. One, could you correlate where women had more rights with greater economic opportunity and the growth of a middle class? And could you correlate greater opportunity for women uh, with more stability, more peace, more opportunity? And in fact, you can. And there was a lot of research done by all kinds of institutions, including some of the private uh, business forecasters, that if every country tore down every obstacle to women's participation in the economy, the gross domestic product of every country would go up, including ours. Because if you look at the participation rate of women in the economy, even in our country, uh, it's held back by lack of childcare, lack of leave policies. Uh, in other countries, of course, it's much more onerous. So I made the argument in uh, the State Department and in speeches around the world that giving and securing, supporting women's rights, opportunities, and participation is not just a nice thing to do because you want to, you know, be nice to your, you know, your daughters and your granddaughters. It is a really important way of increasing your economic activity and the stability of your country. So I think it's a mixed bag. And, you know, in our, our book, that I wrote this book with my daughter, Chelsea, we, we highlight 103 women. And it was really hard. We started with hundreds and had to, you know, keep narrowing it down. But we highlight women who persevered uh, through obstacles and terrible difficulties uh, to make a difference. Uh, over at the Ford School, their leadership definition is, you know, working to make a positive difference for others. Well, these women did that. And there, there's two women I just want to briefly mention who kind of embody the progress. Two women who became presidents of their countries, you know, unlike some places we know. And so <laughs> uh, I'm particularly intrigued by them. But uh, one uh, who became the president of Chile, Michelle Bachelet, and one who became the president of Liberia, first woman elected president of any African country, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. What did they have in common living so far from each other? They were both tortured, mm. beaten, arrested, oppressed, exiled. It happened with Michelle because of Pinochet. Her father died in prison. She and her mother were grabbed up and put into prison and then exiled after being tortured. Ellen Johnson Sirleaf was in the middle of the vicious civil war in Liberia, arrested, beaten, exiled, and they both came back. They both came back to their countries they both got involved in politics, and they both ran for office. And both of them remembered what had happened to them. So they championed, in their own ways, very different political systems, very obviously different economic uh, standing. They championed the rights of women. And Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who saw the horrors of that civil war, the murders, the rapes, the uh, amputations, everything that happened, in her inaugural address said that we want a peaceful nation and part of having a peaceful nation is to let women live their lives in peace. So this was an amazing journey and I wanted more Americans to know about all of the women, but particularly women who didn't just make it on their own, but kept reaching back to make sure others could come along as well. That's great.